Hello, and welcome to the Pragmatic Live podcast series, where we tackle the biggest challenges facing today's product management and product marketing professionals with some of the best minds in the industry. I'm Rebecca Calajaris, Vice President of Marketing at Pragmatic Institute, and your host for this episode. I am very pleased to be joined today by Diane Pearson. She is one of our uh, most extraordinary instructors. She brings to us 20 years experience. She's got product management, product marketing, executive leadership experience at big companies, uh, Dun & Brands, Dun & Bradstreet, LexisNexis. She's also started her own company. She's built teams big and small, and she brings just a great perspective to our show. Welcome, Diane. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. I think it's a great point. And I think it's true for new people who can come in projecting that I can't believe you guys have been this dumb, right, without knowing the context. And I also think it's the existing people who aren't open to the way we've always done things may not be the right way. But because they're both coming with so many assumptions versus discovery conversations, I think sometimes um, egos get in the way of progress and understanding. I think so too. I, I think that We've got folks that, that see other people being hired. They're getting big jobs, big roles. They come in. They don't have the history. They don't ask for the history, and they start changing things. Yeah. On the other hand, we see people who come into organizations sincerely wanting to help and, and work with the people who are there, getting stonewalled. And, and both teams then feel angry and uncomfortable. And you're right. We fall back on our egos. So articulating some of these things and you know we, we didn't mention this but certainly hire humble mm, yeah consistent hire humble but hire persistent companies any company who's hired you clearly has enough money to hire you so they've been doing something right right you know, and, and i've heard a lot of people in class talk about that and, and say well you know we're we're in terrible shape we're in terrible shape and I specifically recall a, a company i've been with um teaching them just recently over the past couple of months. And, and I said, you know, you're not, you, you're a great company. People love you. Uh, you've grown, you, you pivoted in changing markets. So let's remember that you've done a lot of good things. It's just the things that worked before may not work going forward. And we're hiring people to help us take those things forward, but also to take all the good work that's happened. And so we're all standing on each other's shoulders. The, the people who've been here a while are standing on other people's shoulders. The people who come in, they rely on us to hold on to them. And we've just got to make sure that the expectations across both camps uh, bring both of those camps together so that we're all working together. But that's it's got to be done overtly. It, it can't be something where we just let people go out into the market and, or into the company and hope for the best. It's got to be done overtly. A hundred percent. And the other thing I'd just say from my own experience on onboarding, um, so I'm a, a huge believer in onboarding and everyone's always anxious to, to get on to being a contributor, right? Uh, especially when you're onboarding sales, I think it's a, it's a, a particular one, right? They get more money once they start building quota and they're, and so they're, you're throwing a bunch of stuff at them. They're trying to figure out which ones they need to leverage in order to start to do something, to contribute something. Um, and those things that, that are not always some of the things that are the most important aren't the things that deal with the most urgent. And so there's a, a disconnect there. And the other thing is uh, things like personas and buying process. I have definitely found I need to do twice, right? I need to do when they first come on board. So they're familiar with the shorthand we use, right? What does that persona mean? What is that name? What are these people talking about? <laughs> like, who are these random names they keep talking about? Right. But they all, um, and so I need to do that. But the layers that they add on to it in their understanding when we review it again, uh, 60 days, 90 days out, totally different. Same thing even with, with like a product overview. There's what they can absorb in the first part and then what becomes deeper. And I think um, ongoing onboarding or refreshers are something that are just a big opportunity for new and existing employees alike. You know what, and, and that's, that's a big piece of this, that onboarding is an event, isn't an event, it's an ongoing interaction. And so, you know, as we hire people, we have to make onboarding a top priority. I mean, we have to be able to, to commit to this person we're bringing on board 
the time they'll need to get on board, but we also have to make sure that there's other ways to keep that interaction going. I worked for a company, really very good culture in this company. People liked working there. We all did. Hired a lot of new people, and we were pretty successful at it. In this company, everybody was given a mentor, somebody at their peer level who was successful at navigating the organization. But the thing they did that was really different was they had this thing called coffee clubs. And I can't remember it. It seemed to me it varied year by year, depending on how many people we were hiring. But whether it was everybody hired in one quarter or everybody hired in a month, they had this weekly coffee. And it wasn't mandatory, but it was it was the group encouraged each other to go to this thing and their mentors encouraged them to go to this thing. They had coffee one time a week, you know, try to go two, three times a month. They did this for a year. So this coffee was for people who were being onboarded for a year. And then you graduated from it. And it was, it was kind of, it was just this whole process where they, the mentors may come, they may not come. Uh, there were specific meetings where the mentors weren't allowed to come so that the new people, the quote unquote new people could talk amongst themselves. Wow. It was, and it was for a year. And this was the thing that came up over and over and over again, that people would talk about what they liked. And so I think this peer level embedding of people, because at that point, you know, after a year, honestly, you're part of the group then. And if you've got this mentor and you've got this group of mentors and this group of people who started with you, you've got a support network built in. And so you're not on your own. You've got this island of help. And and sometimes if you don't want to ask, like you said, the second time you should ask, but maybe fourth, fifth time, like I totally forgot this thing. Can you tell me what it is? You've got somebody you can go ask. I will also say, you know, when we hire new people, we don't often tell them the way we like to do business as managers. And this is one of those things. It's, it's, great when you hire somebody intuitive, but I'll tell you from personal experience, I'm not very intuitive about these things. Uh, Some bosses are best at seven o'clock at night. Some bosses are better at seven o'clock in the morning. Some would rather get an email. Some would rather bat around an idea verbally. Some are going to want to talk to you two or three times. Others are going to want you to come in and in 15 minutes, give them the decision and have them make it. We know that about ourselves. If we, if we look, we know that. I can articulate my preferred communication style. I can share that with, with a new hire and say, honestly, you're going to be better off if you catch me in the morning. You're going to be better off if you summarize the information. You're going to be better off if you share the facts that brought you to the decision. I can share that in, in that much time. And so I always say to managers, use your words. <laughs> Share this stuff. If you've got a pet peeve, even if it's weird, share it. I don't like to use email. I like to use Slack. I don't like to text. I like to use this. Whatever it is, if you've, if you've got that, if you've got a weird little project that's driving you crazy and you want it done first, it, it may not be part of this person's goals, but just tell them, hey, you know what? I know this is weird, um, but I'd like you to just get this done first. It's a small thing. It's been driving me crazy. If you just get this done, I'd be really happy. Even though, you know, you can look at this and say, really, this is what you want me to start on. I know it's silly, but it's been driving me nuts. I think it's a super good point to be direct and clear on those. They can't read your mind. Um, And most of us are pretty flexible if we know. And instead of making them figure it out, if we're just clear that, hey, these kind of things I like to get on email, we could do I am, but I'm not a text person, whatever. That kind of clarity is big. And even expect, sorry, I think my expectations of after hours or, or weekends or things, right? Um, Different jobs have different expectations there. And, you know, if you say, I might email you because I'm working on something, but I don't expect you to respond until Monday, that's super helpful. Or I won't text you on a weekend or email you on a weekend unless it's something I need an immediate reaction to, right? So like both keeping yourself accountable for those things, but also informing them so that they're not doing behaviors that are contrary to either what you require them or what you want. This I, I totally agree with this because too often we forget as leaders how much impact things we say, 
excuse me, too often as leaders, we, we forget the impact of what we say or, or what we do. If, if we just happen to be catching up with email on a Saturday or a Sunday, we need to make sure people realize this was just the first time I could do it. I do not expect you to be on. Or if we do, we have to own that. And, and if, if you're expecting people to work 24 seven, you need to own that. And you need to tell them that because if they don't realize that, nobody's going to be happy. And those are, those are important things to, to know and understand. I actually did have a boss who was like, I expect you to answer my emails anytime I, I send them within so many minutes or, you know, or maybe an hour or whatever. But I mean, he didn't do it often, but you certainly were clear on the expectation. And I, that is not how I manage, but at least the transparency was there. Um, and that's, yeah. you know, that's something that um, I think having the awkward conversation is, is important. Sometimes we allow our new hires to fail. Because we stick at saying something that either makes us or the company look less than perfect. Yep. Like I had a boss like yours once who handed me my cell phone and said, this is your tether. <laughs> and I thought, ooh, okay. <laughs> I, I get it now. And, and, that, and that implication was very precise and intentional. We slept with our phones by our beds. And sometimes yep. those phones buzzed. Um, that happened. And, and, you know, that was not a, an environment that I wanted to work in. And I didn't, unfortunately, know that ahead of time. Right. But I, I do think if you have to have the awkward conversation. If we, if we need to tell people, you know what, I, every once in a while, our leaders bring back pet projects, or, or they're going to get on a plane, and they're going to get off a plane, and we're going to have a new partner. Or there's, you know, I'll tell you honestly, this this job to me is something that was kind of forced on me. I want us to work together to figure out how it's going to fit into the team. Okay. There are ways to handle these discussions in a, in a productive way without complaining, without getting adversarial, without gossiping. It's hard. It's awkward. But if, if there are things like this that have to be said, they should be said. Somebody ought to say them. And you know what? If it's so bad, you can't say it. It's time to ask yourself what you're doing in that job. And I think this is something, and I've said this to, to more than one individual who's come to me for advice. If it's so bad, you can't share it. It's time to ask yourself what's going on. Because I, the particular individual that comes to mind about a year ago uh, said, you know, of all the things that, that um, he was talking about, the reasons he was frustrated and was looking for a job, he said, I'm, I'm bonused on revenue. I'm bonused on the revenue of my product, and yet nobody can tell me how that revenue is calculated. And I said, well, somebody could. He said, no, you're missing my point. Somebody could. They're just not telling me. He said, they won't answer the question and say it's either none of your business, just believe what we tell you, which, again, is awkward but true. They just wouldn't answer the question. <laughs> and I thought, wow. Wow. Okay. And you know, that's, those are, that's an extreme thing. Most of the time we're not talking about that. Most of the time we're talking about idiosyncrasies. We're talking about, Hey, I hope you understand that sometimes we are a data driven shop, but sometimes we're going to do things that aren't data driven like the rest of the world, like, like we all do. Uh, you know, that's, and, and, and help guide people through those, those spots where logic doesn't seem to be working it. It could be a little weird. Places are places are weird. Yep. It doesn't mean it's bad. But if it is bad, if it's bad, we need to look ourselves in the face and say, wait a minute. This is this is bad. Uh, for sure. And if it's different than what you're used to, you also have to step back and say, is it different bad? In which it might very well be, right? Or is it just different? And I don't need to spend, I don't need to try and force it to the, same way it was before I need to figure out is there a delta that's missing in the existing way and how can I work with it right I think sometimes people are like oh we you know we tracked it this way or we managed it that way or it should look like this and that's a huge point yeah. because you know in organizations where we, so frequently we're hiring new people to be agents of change that that change is something that might be scary to the rest of the organization or not understood 
So we have to smooth the way for that. And so the first question is, is what's happening here so wrong or is this aligned with the change they're trying to make? And if it's aligned with the change, then it's our job to help smooth the way for that, to explain why the new hire is doing what they're doing. And again, it, it does seem like, well, can't they just work this out themselves? They're all grown ups. I shouldn't have to be interceding. And what I always tell people in these situations is, well, you could, you could let it work itself out. And if that's working out for you, great. But if you're letting it work itself out and that's not working, you could either let it unravel or you could do something about it. And which one's more productive? I've always felt like in a positive way, go smooth the way, get these people back into a positive dialogue in a positive relationship by helping them understand each other. That's part of being a leader. And, yep. and it, yes, of course, if people just, if there's a, a pattern there that, that doesn't stop after logic has been presented or, or again, just the, hey, it's not logical, we got to live with it. Then you have other problems and then you, then other action needs to be taken. But let's start with, you know, what if there's, if there's a misunderstanding, let's, let's smooth the way here. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So a lot of these are definitely helpful for onboarding. And then, hey, if we miss something on the onboarding and we're trying to, to salvage it and unwind it, are there any other pieces in that salvage area that you would go, here's another great way of doing it if we've, if we've uh, got a misstep happening? I think the big thing is to communicate, be specific about what's wrong and share what right looks like. Hmm. So it, it, we have to use our words. We have to articulate. And some of these conversations aren't going to be about the deliverable. They're going to be about how we get to the deliverable. As a matter of fact, often we've hired people who look good on paper because they are good on paper and they would be great employees if we could move them past those, those elements of ambient knowledge that are explainable, even if they're a little weird. Yep. Yep. And it's true. Most of them are explainable and weird, not bad, not the thing that's a deal breaker. Um, but the thing you go, oh, okay. You know, yeah. just like all our spouses have quirks that we grow to love. <laughs> that's another podcast. <laughs> Let's do that one sometime. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So is that then the one thing? After we've talked about a bunch of stuff. So the one thing that you would have people begin um, immediately based on what we talked about today. Oh, I'd be so greedy. I'd be greedy in that <laughs> too. The first one would be expand the, the onboarding process to help the employee do more than just fill out the insurance paperwork. The second one would be to make time for onboarding. Be clear, discuss ownership overtly, help smooth the way, make this an, an ongoing process and, and answer those hard questions and, and answer all questions thoroughly. And, does, yeah. And, 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 you know, that, blah, 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 blah. okay, there you go. A dribbly ending. Blue, 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 blue. Yeah, I think <laughs> I actually think the spouse thing will be the best ending for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Diane, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciated the conversation. I appreciate the insights you have on leadership. And as always, uh, you push me to be a better leader and a better employee. Well, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal at least three of the things you said today, Rebecca. So thanks so much for the opportunity. Uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon. All right. That does it for today's episode. Thanks everyone for listening. And don't forget to join us next week when we tackle another great topic designed to help you elevate your product, your company, and your career. 